In this video, I'm going to be teaching you the advanced prompt engineering theory and methods used by professionals around the world right now that's going to take you from a beginner to an expert in just one video. What I'm about to teach you is going to make you better than 99% of all other prompt engineers by using the tried and tested methods and templates used by professionals in the industry right now. If you're new to the channel, my name is Liam Otley and I have my own AI development company and the methods I'm going to teach you in this video are the exact things that myself and my developers use every day in building applications for clients so we can get the exact output out of these large language models that we want. Now, if you haven't already watched my beginner's guide to prompt engineering, it will be available up here. You're gonna to need to go and watch that first because in this video, we're going to be picking up exactly where we left off in that video. Now, as in my beginner's guide, this video is not going to be focused on prompting within ChatGPT. I think there's enough content out there for people looking to sort of do it on a personal level and get more out of ChatGPT. What we are really interested here is writing prompts within the OpenAI Playground. This is because any functionality that we can achieve within the OpenAI Playground can then be bundled up and put into an API call and allow us to access that functionality programmatically and at scale. Basically, writing prompts in ChatGPT is great for individual use, but if you're looking to become a prompt engineer or build applications with AI technology, you need to be using the OpenAI Playground because that's how you're going to be able to build applications with that functionality that you create. Now, if you're not convinced that prompt engineering is one of the highest leverage skills that you can learn in 2023, just check out this hiring post from Anthropic, which is offering up to $300,000 per year for someone with prompt engineering experience. They even say that because this is such a new field, there's no way for them to expect five years of experience and that if you're applying, just provide some examples of cool prompting setups that you've created. In this video, I'm going to be covering advanced LLM theory, the perfect prompt structure, a deep dive into advanced parameters and what they do. And finally, the most crucial part that everyone seems to forget, evaluation. The first step in improving as a prompt engineer from beginner to advanced is actually improving your understanding of these large language models and how they work. Without understanding how these models actually generate text, you're not gonna be able to understand the advanced parameters and be able to really get the right output out of them. So we can break it down from the beginning and understanding that large language models are essentially an autocomplete engine that are very, very good at guessing the next token. So large language models like GPT-3 or 4 are essentially really, really powerful autocomplete engines that are great at predicting the next word or next token. Now words and tokens get used sort of interchangeably, but there's actually a difference. Each token is about four characters, meaning some words like earnings will be split up into earnings. When GPT-3 generates text, it's essentially guessing the next token over and over and over until it has completed the text that you asked for. The next token is chosen by randomly sampling from a list of probabilities. The better the token fits into the sentence based on the training knowledge GPT has been provided with, the higher its probability of being chosen as that next token. For example, I'm in the OpenAI Playground right now. The link to get onto that will be in the description, but I've written Humpty Dumpty sat on a now we all know what comes next, but essentially these models now have to predict what's next and based on probability, it will choose the appropriate word. Humpty Dumpty sat on a, and it's correctly completed the rest of the Humpty Dumpty nursery rhyme because that's the most likely thing to come next. So it's gone one by one and gone wall. Okay, then Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And if you go down to the bottom right here, you can turn on the show probabilities and here I have it on full spectrum. Then you're able to go and see what the probability of this next token was. So understandably it was wall at 99% likelihood that this is going to be the next token. And as you can see for the rest of the nursery rhyme, it's had a pretty easy time predicting each of the next tokens because there's so many examples of this nursery rhyme in its training data as well. Now, one of the magic things about large language models like GPT is that they are non-deterministic, meaning you are not gonna get the exact same response every single time because of that probability table. It's going to be sampling from that table each time. So every time you regenerate the text, Yes, it might have 99% being a certain token, but there's still that 1% chance every time it re-rolls that token that it's gonna take the different one and then essentially go down a different path. This is built into all GPT products because of the transformer technology that it is all based on, which was created by Google. Now, one of the defining points of this transformer architecture that these are built on top of is what's called the attention mechanism. It is so crucial to understand that this random sampling process is occurring every single time a new token is generated. This is because OpenAI has given prompt engineers like us a toolkit of tools that we can use to essentially manipulate how this random sampling process occurs. These tools we've been provided with are called advanced parameters, and we're gonna be covering them later in the video. Now, as prompt engineers, we have two different levers that we can pull on in order to get what we want out of these models, and these are the prompts 
and the parameters that I just spoke about. Let's focus on nailing the prompt first, introducing the perfect prompt template. This template is very flexible, but essentially contains the ingredients you need to include in any prompt that you write for any application or client or whatever you're using your prompt engineering skills for. But it's these five ingredients you always need to include in your prompt if you really want to get the best outcome. Firstly, you need context. Secondly, you need a specific goal. Thirdly, you need a specific format that you want the answer in. And fourth, you need to break down big tasks into smaller tasks. And finally, you need to provide examples. It's easiest to illustrate all of these aspects of a great prompt through a scenario. So you are a job seeker and you want to find the perfect company to work for, but you have some specific requirements to consider. Your relevant job experience or qualifications, your desired industry or sector, and your desired company size. Now we have to imagine that the bot that we are speaking to would have access to a database of jobs that are currently available in the United States or something. But an example of a bad prompt that most people would probably write is, make me a list of 30 companies in the tech sector that may need a full stack engineer that have less than 1000 employees and why they would be an ideal employer. Now this kind of prompt is probably very familiar to the kind of stuff you're used to asking ChatGPT, but oftentimes when you're working with sort of production grade prompt engineering and you're creating it for applications, you don't have the opportunity to essentially go back and forth and tweak it the way that you do with ChatGPT. So we need to be a lot more specific in order to get the kind of output we want on a consistent basis. Now, here we have a perfect prompt using the perfect prompt template that I just provided. It has all five ingredients required to create a good prompt and maximize our chances of getting the outcome we want. Now, first we have the context, which often includes some sort of role prompting, which is something I went over in my beginner's guide, which is again up here if you haven't watched it, but we're essentially setting this into a role where it is an expert recruitment manager who assists people in finding the perfect job. So we're first providing a bit of context as to who the bot is. Then after it, we provide a little bit more context on who I am, and what I'm interested in doing. Then the next section of this prompt is give me a list of 30 companies in the following format. So this is ingredient number two. We are setting a specific goal that we wanna to work towards or an objective for this entire prompt. What do we want out of this bot? Thirdly, I've provided a specific format of how I want it to respond. So I've used square brackets here, but you can use curly brackets or any other sort of spacing characters you want, but essentially just showing it the kind of output format that you are after. In the next sentence, I've told it to do an additional task. So what we've done here is separated the tasks so if you do this and then do this rather than do this 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 and this so splitting it up is a way to get better outcomes because it allows the llm to work through it progressively and get more accurate results that way and finally what i've done is added the last ingredient which is providing an example i have used the same format name of company name of number of employees remote available etc i have bob software inc the name of the company the number of employees, the ISA remote available, which is yes, and then the salary. And then I've gone on to do the second task, which is a little bit of a blurb as to why they would be an ideal employer. I think it's pretty obvious when you compare the results from the bad prompt with the results of the perfect prompt template, just how much of a difference you can make by using this template and providing the model with the instructions and context it needs to really get the job done right. Now, as I mentioned before, us prompt engineers have two main levers that we can pull in order to get what we want out of these language models, and that is the prompt and the advanced parameters. So now that you've got the first half out of the way, we can focus on learning what all of the advanced parameters do and how you can modify them to get what you want out of these models. To go over the advanced parameters, we are back in the OpenAI Playground. Again, the link will be in the description for you to hop onto this with me. But essentially on the side panel here on the right, we have all of the advanced parameters that we're able to play with in order to get the response that we want out of these models. Now it is crucial to understand that the way most of these advanced parameters work is by modifying how words appear in the random sampling table when the next token is chosen. Now I have gone over these in my beginner's guide, but today we're gonna to go a little bit deeper and really understand what's going on under the hood. So first we have the temperature or randomness of the output. What is actually going on here is that when you increase the temperature, you're essentially flattening the probability curve and, and making it more likely that you get less likely works. We can illustrate this on screen by doing a quick little prompt, be strong like a... So if I set the temperature to zero and, and submit be strong like a oak tree, what you're able to see is that we have tree coming in at 97%. Now, if I change the temperature, we will see that there's different spreads here. And now we got mountains. And now by increasing the temperature to one, we have a completely different set of words and a different probability spread. So we have a new character coming in at 58%. We have a capital M as the next token at 15%. Oak is now down to 14% and is third in the list. So as you can see, this is a lot flatter. It's not sort of 95 and then coming into like 2%, etc. It's a lot more spread out, meaning that you're going to get more varied answers in most cases. Now, as I click through all of these tokens, you're gonna to see a very, very flat spread on all of these tokens here. So it's 16, 13, 12, 
etc. So it's all quite a flat distribution of the probabilities of the words that it's choosing from. This means the chance of me getting this exact same paragraph is basically zero because every time it goes through here, it's basically sort of a one in five chance that it gets this word. So it can go in so many different directions. So as a prompt engineer, temperature is one of the most valuable tools in your toolkit because you're able to essentially change between very creative responses that are going to go many different ways and get very different outputs every time. Or if you're looking for something in a different field or industry that needs to have really consistent, reliable outcomes and not be making stuff up all the time, you can set it to zero. And most people for most applications are setting it to zero just because they'd prefer to get that sort of regular as deterministic as possible output. Stop sequences are another little handy tool in your toolkit. It's essentially being able to tell the large language model where they need to stop. This can be with a full stop or a double new line, or you could have say bot with a colon after it. Essentially just telling these large language models where to stop because they don't know where to stop themselves. So here I've generated be strong like A and then it's gone oak tree and continued on and on and on. So what if I just wanted to stop after that oak tree there? So I can add a full stop as a stop sequence and then regenerate this. And then we have a stop at oak tree. Some common stop sequences are using a double new line. So you can do this by going a backslash in backslash in and that's going to essentially stop the generation when there's a, a new paragraph or if you're doing some few shot prompting and you really want to make it clear that this is where one set of prompting completion pairs stop and another one starts you can use something like a, a quadruple pound sign as i've done here another powerful tool that you have in your toolkit is called top p and this is essentially a slider that allows you to choose what words you want to be allowed within the sampling table if you have it set to one it's going to allow all of the words in the table to have a chance of being selected. So essentially the computer can go through, even if the percentage is 0.1% chance, it can still go down there and occasionally hit that. Or if you set it all the way to zero, it's going to always pick the most common answer and it's not going to give it any other option. So this is obviously another very powerful tool in your toolkit in order to get those deterministic outputs where you don't want any creativity, but you really want it to just give the same sort of output over and over and over again. If you're integrating into an application or, or some kind of situation where you can't have that, that sort of winding path that can go off in any direction. Then you have frequency penalty and presence penalty, which though under the hood, they operate slightly differently. They typically have the same kind of output and same kind of effects on your completion. Essentially increasing the slider here is going to punish the model more and more for using the same words over and over again. So those advanced parameters are your most powerful tools as a prompt engineer to essentially control that second lever and be able to determine the output that you want out of the models. As I mentioned, this all goes back to how these models work under the hood, which is predicting the next token based off random sampling out of a table. These advanced parameters allow us to modify the table that the computer is choosing from, be it through temperature and, and changing the probability of these words, or be it through something like top P where it's actually modifying the words it's allowed to choose from. The final stage of writing any prompt that's going to be used in an application or at large scale is evaluation and determining how well it's performing. For some kind of prompts, this can be very easy. For others, it can be a little bit more difficult. For example, if you're setting up your LLM to do classification tasks and you're essentially just telling it to output a number, so maybe a zero, a one, or a two, it's much easier to say, yes, okay, we're getting it right 95% of the time, rather than if it's a text output, then it's almost impossible to determine what is correct and what isn't because it's, it's subjective. So what we're doing with this process of prompt evaluation is taking that perfect prompt that I wrote and then doing a couple of different variations of it. Maybe I provide some more examples or I change a bit of the role prompting. I tell it a bit more information about who it is. Just adding different things into the prompt so that I have variation between them. Once I have the variation of the prompt, I need to create a prompt template out of them. Each prompt template has a specific set of characters that serves as a placeholder for the user prompt to be injected into. And then we need to come up with a few different prompts that this application may be provided with. And then we're going to replace that prompt variable with it, run it, send it off to the API and get it back and, and evaluate the response. Now by creating five different versions of this prompt template, we're able to get many different versions of prompts and test them against all of them individually and then compare the outputs and see which one's performing best. If you have a classification task, you can use a Python script to determine the accuracy of the model at predicting the right things. But for text-based outputs, it can be a little bit more difficult. I'm gonna be showing you one of the methods that myself and my team use when we're building applications for clients in order to test a bunch of different prompts and see which one is performing the best when the outcome is a text-based outcome. Now, the easiest way to do this is actually programmatically, but don't worry, you don't have to code anything. I've already done it for you. All you need to do is come onto Replit and clone this REPL and you're going to be able to do all of this super easy, just paste in your prompts and templates. But let me walk you through how this works. So the final outcome here is going to be a spreadsheet where you have 
the first column as the prompts that you've put in. All the following columns are going to be the different prompt templates and the data in between are the outcomes that are generated by that prompt template combined with that prompt. So in Replit here on the left side, you have the templates.py. Now this looks a little bit complicated, but don't worry about it. This is essentially the name of your template. So you might want to call it template one, template two, etc. And then you need to include the, the prompt that you've written and then just include this little placeholder here, which is going to be the user prompt injected into it. So it's a dollar sign followed by P-R-O-M-T in capitals. And once you've got your templates added in, then you can go to the prompt section. Now I've just asked ChatGPT to generate a bunch of prompts for your specific use case. You can probably do the same thing. Just ask ChatGPT, give me a hundred different prompts for da, 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 and then it will generate it. If you need it in a Python list, that's what you can tell it as the format. And then you just paste them all on here. So I have some about the Roman empire here. And then the template is some about a, essentially a historian who's going to help you learn things. I don't know. It's a pretty bad example, but you get, the, you get the idea. So once you have your prompts added in and your prompt templates added in, the idea is to get out this evaluation results CSV, which you can then put into Google Sheets, which I'll show you in a sec. But this is going to essentially give you an output for all of the different prompt templates and prompt combinations. All you need to do here is replace your OpenAI key here and just paste it in between those quotations. Now, I don't want to bore you with all of this stuff, but essentially it's going to go through, combine all of them, send them off to an API request, get them back, and then you're going to have it output into that CSV. So if I run this, I've already run it and it comes out over here. Now I can take this, you click here, and then you're going to need to press run. And then what it's going to do is, is combine all of them, send them off to an OpenAI completions endpoint, get all of the responses back, and then save them to this evaluation results.csv. So once you have the CSV, you can click here to download it. And then you can come over to Google Sheets. You can import it. Then what I find you need to do is actually go to data, data cleanup and trim white space. And there you go. So now you have all of your different results compared to the different prompts you have. So it's the combination of the prompt template and the prompt. And now you need to go through and read them and essentially evaluate on average, which one is performing best. This is a bad example, but for your specific use case, I'm sure you're about to tell which one is giving you the better responses. Then you can just iteratively go through this and say, okay, this prompt is working better than this. Let me go back and maybe make a couple more tweaks and do this process again. So this is a good way of just comparing how different prompts work and whether you're getting closer and closer to the outcome that you want. Now you're gonna be able to clone this REPL. It's gonna be in the link in the description. So if you any prompt evaluation you need to do, just go down there and check that out. You may need to convert this to a chat completions version, but you can probably just paste this whole thing into ChatGPT and ask it to convert it. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them down in the comments below. Now, I thought I'd include one more example of a no code way of doing this evaluation that isn't quite as efficient, but still gets the job done. Now, it's in an app called Promptable. Now I have a, a prompt written here. I'll leave a link to Promptable in the description. You can come over here and write in your prompt. Now, when using Promptable, it only allows you to use one prompt at a time but it essentially allows you to see multiple responses at once instead of having to go through them manually. So what I've got here is a prompt I made in a previous video. You can put yours in here. Now you need to include some kind of input field here. You do that by a double curly bracket. And then what you need to do is head over to the evaluate tab. Now you need to add a output row. Click on the column here and you write input. And here again, and we go output and change this to output. Then we can start to add rows, add row, add row, add row. Now you can use ChatGPT to generate expected inputs. So for example, this is a, a stoic mentor bot. Now you need to figure out what you want as the input. So you can probably go to ChatGPT and generate a bunch of these, which is what I'll do now. Now the magic with this is that you're able to see a ton of different outputs at once for different inputs. Now this speeds up the process a ton. Obviously the programmatic version is a lot quicker and you can do much larger amounts with multiple different prompt templates. But what you could then do is take all of these and put it in a spreadsheet manually. But essentially this allows you to quickly eyeball what the outcomes for the prompt are on a sort of larger batch scale. So that about wraps it up for this advanced prompt engineering tutorial. Everything you need to know has been in this video. So I hope you got something out of it and you're able to take this so that you can start to make more money as a prompt engineer or you can start writing better prompts for your applications and, and start building some software and creating money and value for yourself in this ecosystem. Now, if you've made it this far and you've enjoyed the video, please hit down below and leave a like. It would mean the world to me. And if you like this kind of content, this is the sort of stuff I do all the time, be sure to head down below and subscribe to the channel and check out my other videos for more like this. If you're looking for a community to join with prompt engineers or other aspiring AI entrepreneurs, be sure to check out my Discord, which will be available in the pinned comment and in the description as well. 
And there we're talking about AI entrepreneurship, how to build businesses, prompt engineering, ChatGPT plugins, everything under the sun. So if you want to get in there with a bunch of like-minded people, be sure to check that out in the description. And I also have my own AI development company. So if you have an idea for an app or a platform that you want to get built out, you can have a chat with me through my consulting link and we can get something sorted out.